In all systems of slavery, ancient and modern, slaves were seen as property, which meant that masters had great discretion in how they treated their slaves. Masters could sexually abuse their slaves, and this was a problem both in the ancient world and the antebellum South. Matter of fact, two early black leaders, Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington, both had white fathers, but they didn't know who they were. Now in our first story, James, who flees slavery, tells us how his master Joshua had three common law slave wives. William Still, the narrator, tells us that James was a tiller of the soil under the yoke of Joshua Hitch, who lived on a farm about 17 miles from Baltimore. James spoke rather favorably of him. Indeed, it was through a direct act of kindness on the part of his master that he was able to escape. The sheriff had been visiting their house, and James was wondering if this meant that they might soon be sold. His master owned three other adult slaves beside James, and they were females. One was his chief housekeeper, and with them, all his social relations were of such a nature as to lead James and others to think and say that they were all his wives. Joshua was quite fond of the two sisters, though he felt he may need to sell a third female slave. Joshua trusted James to travel to Baltimore to find a kind master, but James instead traveled to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he contacted the Abolitionist Vigilance Committee, who helped him to travel to Canada on the Underground Railroad Network. James was 31 years of age and rather a fine-looking man of a chestnut color and quite intelligent. He had been a married man, but for two years before his escape he had been a widower, as his wife had been sold away from him to North Carolina. He had received only three letters from her, and he had given up all hope of ever seeing her again. He had two little boys living in Baltimore, whom he was obligated to leave. Their names were Edward and William. What became of them afterward was never known, though they suspected that all had been sold to settle the master's debts. Many masters had intimate relationships with their slaves. Five years after Thomas Jefferson's wife passed away in 1782, Thomas Jefferson traveled to Paris as an American diplomat, accompanied by a slave, Sally Hemings, who was a pretty 14 and light enough that she could pass as white. During their posting, they were intimate, and he had many children by Sally. She was technically free in France, and slavery was illegal there, and consented to return to America after Jefferson promised that their children would be emancipated, a promise that was fulfilled. In most systems of slavery in both the ancient world and the antebellum South, masters could beat, maim, and even murder their slaves, and slaves were property. However, abuse of slaves eased somewhat under the influence of the Stoic philosophers and early church fathers. But it was common in the antebellum South for masters to abuse their slaves, though they rarely killed them since they were valuable property. But no mercy was shown to slaves who were brutally whipped by their masters, which Frederick Douglass often witnessed. No mercy was shown to suffering slaves in the antebellum South. Philip Younger remembers, I served in slavery for 55 years and am now nearly 72 years old. I was born in Virginia and went to 10 to Tennessee and at 12 to Alabama, serving as the body servant of a military man. My treatment was sometimes rough and sometimes good. Many awful scenes I have seen while moving about. I have had to put chains on men myself to go into a chain game. I have seen men whipped to death. I have seen them die. I have ridden hundreds of miles in Alabama and have heard the whip going from farm to farm while they are weighing out cotton. In Alabama, the patrols go out in companies at about dark and ride nearly all night. If they meet a colored man without a pass, it's 39 lashes, but they don't stop for the law. And if they tie a man up, he is very well off if he gets only 200 lashes. And as a general rule, the treatment on Alabama plantations is very hard. Once in a while a man is kind, as kindness is out there, and then he is hated by all the other masters. They say his niggers spoil our niggers. There's a free man in Huntsville, a barber, whose wife, a free woman, was taken by a patrol as she was walking out at dark and put in jail, just to disgrace her. Her husband grumbled about it, a rumpus was made, and people collected in front of the tavern door. Then folks then called out, shoot the damn nigger. The patrol stabbed him with a bowie knife and he fell in the street. He was carried in and a doctor dressed the wound, but he was never a sound man afterward. I hired my time and made some money. I bought my wife's freedom first and sent her away. I got off by skill. Escape from Alabama is almost impossible. If a man escapes, it is by the skin of his teeth. And I still have children and grandchildren in slavery. Philip escaped to the northern states, but after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, he fled to Ontario, Canada. Talking about his new home, he said, I had rather starve to death here, being a free man, than to have plenty in slavery. 
I cannot be a slave anymore. Nobody could hold me as a slave now except in irons. Old as I am, I would rather die at the point of a sword than go into slavery. There was considerable abuse of slaves in the Deep South. It was a miracle that young Theophilus not only survived a brutal beating and knife attack from his cruel master, but also his trek to freedom. Theophilus is 24 years of age, dark, height and stature hardly medium. His bearing is subdued and modest, yet he is not lacking in earnestness. Says Theophilus, I was in servitude under a man named Houston near Luz, Delaware. He was a very mean man. He didn't allow you enough to eat, nor enough clothes to wear. He never allowed a drop of tea or coffee or sugar. And if you didn't eat your breakfast before day broke, he wouldn't allow you any. He had a wife meaner than he was. Four years ago, my master cut my entrails out for going to a meeting at Daniel Wesley's church one Sabbath night. Monday morning, he called me up to whip me. He called me into his dining room, locked the doors, and then ordered me to pull off my shirt. I told him, no sir, I wouldn't. He tore my shirt off after I would not pull it off, and he ordered me to cross my hands. I didn't do that. After that, he got his gun and broke the breech over my head. Then he seized the fire tongs and struck me over the head. And then he took the parlor shovel and he beat on me till he broke the handle. I told him I was bound to come out of that room. Then he ran up to the door and drawed his knife and told me if I ventured to the door, he would stab me. I aimed straight for the door, but before I reached it, he stabbed me, drawing the knife as hard as he could, ripped across my stomach. And right away, he began stabbing me about my head. After a desperate struggle, Theophilus succeeded in getting out of the building. And then Theophilus remembers, I started at once for Georgetown, carrying a part of my entrails in my hands for the whole journey, 16 miles. I went to my young masters, and they took me to an old colored woman named Judith Smith. And for five days and nights, I was under treatment of three doctors. I was not expected to live for a long time, but the doctors cured me at last. And this title of the story states that Theophilus arrived from Delaware in 1858, but the excerpts only describes his maltreatment and not how he lived to tell a story to abolitionists. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Most of the accounts in this Dover collection of slave narratives of the Underground Railroad describe how slaves escaped to freedom and what their lives were like as slaves in the antebellum south. Many of these narratives, included some that we discussed today, were recorded by William Still, a free black abolitionist. His father had bought his freedom in 1798 in Maryland, moving north to New Jersey. His mother escaped from slavery in Maryland twice. William was the youngest of 14 children, and he was active in the Abolitionist Vigilance Committee, assisting as a conductor of the Underground Railroad to guide up to 800 runaway slaves to freedom. And behind me, I also have W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction and Souls of Black Folk. Now, in our first video in our series of slave narratives, Harry Jacobs sailed for freedom after hiding for many years on a plantation. We read of Eliza Harris, who's escaped with her infant daughter, crawling from one block of ice to another, inspiring a scene in Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, the novel that helped spark the Civil War. Harriet Tubman was perhaps the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad. She returned to Maryland 19 times to lead family members and other slaves to freedom. And we reflect on the amusing story of Henry Box Brown, who had himself boxed up and shipped to freedom in Philadelphia. The pale slave Ellen Craft impersonated a disabled white man whose trusty servant who was really her husband, assisted her in their train ride to freedom. Some slaves did have kind masters, such as Arnold Gragston, who was one of the few slave conductors on the Underground Railroad, as his master did not ask too many questions about his frequent absences. And we have the proud slave Margaret, who fled with her infant to freedom to escape slavery in a brutal whipping, with help from Watch, her mastiff, who saved their lives. And we have the tragic story of Margaret Garner, the slave mother who killed her daughter rather than to doom it to a life of sexual exploitation as a slave. And she was the inspiration for the main character in Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.